How much would a pinch of sand be worth to you? How about without the elements of gold or platinum mixed into it, just moon dust? A recent auction sold it for half a million dollars, for literally just a pinch of what's on the moon. But this apparently valuable minuscule amount of dirt was valued purely on its historical relevance. That pinch of sticky moon sand was from a small pouch that was collected by Neil Armstrong on the Apollo 11 mission in 1969. It was a huge piece of human history and a physical reminder of when man first landed on the moon, something taken from a place that no one else has ever been able to. Selling something from the moon opens a whole new debate around the legality of owning, using, and selling space resources from unclaimed parts of the solar system. Currently, the world abides by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which depicts the foundations of modern space law. This treaty, established so long ago, didn't predict the lucrative use of outer worlds for resource utilization. Although this treaty prevents anyone from claiming ownership of any new worlds, the potential value of these unclaimed territories is priceless. The moon is not only a stepping stone for future exploration into outer space, from which moon bases and possibly moon cities will one day thrive. For this purpose, humans will need to develop shipping bays and factories to support carriers to cross into new worlds. This project will need some good investments. Mining stations will provide the economy of the hypothetical moon city. There will be infrastructure and transportation to the moon and back again. All of this will cost a lot, way more than a reminder of when man first walked on the moon. So apart from moon dust, what else could be valuable on the moon? There is value in the resources on the moon. We don't know the exact numbers, but it's estimated that there is more than was thought in the past. The Earth's natural satellite is believed to be abundant with iron, nickel, and cobalt, amongst many more. These minerals provide the potential for building Moon City itself. Just as in human history, cities around the world are a reflection of what resources are in abundance in their surroundings, and Moon City will be the same in that way. A gray city, walls made with metal, iron dust, and a lunar sand concrete, with great windows made from the unlimited sand available. The moon is also rich in silicon, an important ingredient in producing solar panel arrays. There's calcium to be used to fabricate the silicon-based solar cells, along with other ingredients found there, like titanium oxide, iron, and aluminum. The long dormant lunar magma ocean residing under its surface holds magnesium. It's especially prominent within the lower crust and is useful for many purposes, most importantly for alloys with expected space travel. The production of steel requires many sources of carbon, crucially important for supporting the mega factories and for the many thousands of ships that will be built. Numerous rare earth materials are used in everything electrical. They continue to be more valuable and their production is more prominent as technology progresses, especially in electric vehicles and wind turbines. Although rare earth materials are abundant on our planet, you won't find them in many concentrated areas. They are spread thin throughout the earth, so locating and mining them is pretty costly, though they're more required with every year. The process of finding and mining on the moon is far easier and will be an important alternate source. Nitrogen, along with carbon, are important elements to support human colonization and farming and ensure that the moon is not only habitable, but has a constant supply of food. We can obtain them within the moon's outer crust, so farming is possible there within sealed biospheres. Mining metals is a difficult process, but the result is worth it, not only for their value, but also because of the valuable byproducts that you can get in the process of extraction. It can be oxygen, available for breathable air within the city, and hydrogen to ensure water for the plants and for drinking. Valuable resources will not only come from within the surface of the moon. Its potential for solar power is so huge, it will ensure harvesting the solar waves to power Moon City. The fact that it lacks a thick atmosphere and that there's no interruption of weather patterns removes some major obstacles that are present on Earth. The energy created could be sufficient for all requirements on the moon 
and, in the short term, may also help solve many of Earth's power concerns. Extracting resources and manufacturing requirements will be significant as time carries forward. As Moon City is going to grow and humans will reach further into outer space, it will require more and more energy. The output to factories and production on the Moon will become so elaborate that they will need alternate sources in reserve. Atom-powered fusion will be an important source of energy with no dangerous byproduct. It will be safer than the technologies of today that use uranium. Feeding this kind of fusion will require the most valuable of all resources found on the Moon, helium-3. It's not only present on the Moon, but can also be found on Earth. But the amount is super limited here due to our planet's strong magnetic field. It ensures life can thrive on Earth, but at the same time, deflects the solar winds from the sun, making it difficult for helium-3 to be produced. The moon has no magnetic field and has been absorbing the solar wind for billions of years, constantly building up an endless supply of helium-3 in the process. It absorbs the winds into the top layer of solid material on the moon, also known as the regolith. The regolith is spread all over the moon and it makes the extraction of the helium-3 an even more valuable action. Mining it would also include mining all the other valuable minerals in the process. The value of helium-3 is so substantial that many countries and companies are determined to gain a foothold on the moon. The value of this alone is within trillions of dollars. Some people believe the opportunities that helium-3 will give humanity are immeasurable. There will be unlimited energy providing millions of jobs in Moon City. That energy will also support the Earth's needs. Only 25 tons of helium-3 could power the United States for an entire year. This resource will provide the potential to power all of Earth for thousands of years and have enough energy required to help guide humans further into space. It will enable the construction of spaceports around Earth and allow for a more efficient journey from Earth to orbit. From there, people will be transferred to shuttles destined for other locations throughout the solar system. The lengths of spaceflight will be reduced significantly, creating more frequent flights toward Mars. Further ports will be erected around its orbit, supporting new colonies to reside on its surface. Mining colonies with the support of endless energy will spread throughout the red planet, with more valuable resources residing within its red soil. This new age of colonization in the solar system will cause a domino effect as it continues to push further, advancing with every generation of vessels developed. Travel will get more and more efficient as the Helium-3 will continue to assist in advancing the technology of spacefaring ships. Outposts of all purposes will develop on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. From researching for potential habitability for life on Europa or Enceladus, to continuing the tradition of extracting valuable resources in every location. The Moon will continue to find ways to provide the energy that's needed for terraforming new worlds. It will assist in warming Mars and powering an artificial magnetic field. It will also help with constructing a large reflector that will be able to cool down Venus. All of these will be the foundations for creating further livable locations for future generations of humans all thanks to that initial source of energy from the Moon. It's difficult to put an overall price tag on the Moon, even when you know that there is value in harvesting its resources. The value of what the Moon dust really amounts to can't be determined by a monetary figure, but by its potential to influence what humans can create as we continue to progress as a species. Deep in the heart of the universe, there's a mysterious and powerful force hidden waiting to be unlocked. It's a force that could change the world as we know it, and it's called antimatter. Let's discover what this thing is and how we could use it to turn our lives upside down. Antimatter is the science fiction fantasy come to life. You may have heard about it in Star Trek and Star Wars, but it's actually a real thing that scientists have been studying for over a century. But what is it exactly, and how is it different from regular matter? Well, let's start with the basics. 
You probably know that atoms are made up of tiny particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. These particles are all made of matter, which is what we're all made of and what makes up everything around us. And antimatter is just like that, but with a twist. Instead of protons, antimatter atoms have something called antiprotons. And instead of neutrons, they have antineutrons. And instead of electrons, they have positrons. Almost got you there. Basically, antimatter is made up of particles with opposite charge, spin, and other properties of regular matter. While a proton has a positive charge and an antiproton has a negative charge, and while an electron has a negative charge, an anti-electron, also known as a positron, has a positive charge. Get it? Antimatter is kind of like an evil twin of regular matter. It's the mirror image of everything that we're all familiar with. Just like how Batman has the Joker, matter has antimatter. So, if you ever wanted to know what it's like to be in a world where everything is made of the opposite, this would be your answer. And here's the best part: when the antimatter and matter particles meet, they literally annihilate each other, releasing a tremendous amount of energy at the same time. This is why scientists believe that it could provide an almost limitless source of power. Now, you might be wondering, where is all this antimatter? Why don't we have these antiparticles flying around and throwing crazy fireworks after every touch with regular particles? Actually, scientists believe that during the Big Bang, matter and antimatter were created in equal amounts, but for some reason, matter came to dominate. So, when they started destroying each other, in the end, ordinary matter won by a hair. Why did it happen? We still have no idea. This is one of the biggest mysteries in physics. All we know is that in the end, that's how we got the universe we know today. Makes you wonder what our universe would look like if regular matter lost. But that's a topic for another day. Antimatter is considered to be one of the most fascinating things in science. It has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of the universe, and of course, may be a new source of energy. Imagine a fuel that could power a spaceship to the far reaches of the galaxy, or a power plant that could provide for an entire city. This is what we can get if we solve this puzzle. But how was antimatter even discovered? Especially considering that there was nothing left of it at the beginning of the universe. Well, scientists were able to discover it in a very clever way. First of all, we have to go back in time to the early 20th century. That's when a physicist named Paul Dirac predicted the existence of antimatter. He had a theory that for every particle of matter in the universe, there must be a corresponding antiparticle. This idea made a huge fuss at the time, but his theory was later confirmed experimentally. In the 1930s, another physicist named Carl Anderson discovered the positron. The opposite of the electron, it was the first known antimatter particle, and this discovery was a huge breakthrough in science. Scientists soon discovered more antiparticles, and it sparked a whole new field of study: antimatter physics. We're still exploring it to this day. But how did we even discover these particles? Didn't we just say that there was no antimatter left after the Big Bang? Well, not really. There is some antimatter in space. It's just very rare, and finding it is a real treasure hunt. Scientists look for antimatter in space by searching for cosmic rays that are made up of antimatter particles. We can also create antimatter in laboratories. Right now, scientists use super cool machines called particle accelerators for that. The most famous one is the CERN's Large Hadron Collider, which is the biggest, most famous collider in the world. These machines shoot tiny particles at super high speeds. It's kind of like a cosmic game of billions. When these particles crash into each other, they create antimatter particles. Then they use special containers called penning traps to store the antimatter. It's like keeping a tiny supernova in a jar. 
Now, thanks to antimatter, we can change our entire world. Scientists have estimated that even just a tiny bit of it, like a couple of ounces, could give you the same energy as burning millions of gallons of gasoline. So even with a tiniest amount of it, you could power an entire city for a year. It's like holding the power of a star in your hand. That's why the scientific community is working on ways to use this superpower to make our lives better. They want to use it to make electricity, like we do with coal and natural gas. In the future, it could be used as a super clean and infinite energy source. They also want to use it to power spaceships so we can travel to other planets and stars. Imagine a rocket that could take us to the farthest reaches of the galaxy, powered by the energy of antimatter. Even a small amount of it could power a spacecraft for a very long time. And that's not all. Antimatter can also be used in medicine. Scientists are trying to use it to fight cancer and make images of the inside of our bodies. It's like a super tool that can help doctors in many ways. In short, antimatter is amazing and powerful, and now we just have to figure out how to use it. And here comes the catch. Even though antimatter is super powerful, but also super tricky to make and keep around. It takes a lot of energy to make even a tiny bit of antimatter. It requires incredibly high energy inputs, making it very expensive to produce in large quantities. These are also some other problems. For example, once we've got our tiny amount of antimatter, how do we store it? We can't just put it in a jar. Antiparticles are extremely unstable and they're also attracted to regular matter like a magnet to a fridge. So, scientists have come up with some clever ways to store it, like trapping them in a vacuum or storing them in some incredibly strong magnetic fields. And even then, it's still a delicate and expensive process. These and many other reasons explain why antimatter isn't viable for large-scale production yet. If you were trying to fill up your car's gas tank with antimatter, it would cost more than a small country's GDP. But even though creating antimatter is an enormous scientific challenge, the potential rewards are huge. That's why right now, scientists are working on finding ways to produce and store it in a more efficient and cost-effective way. And if they succeed, it could become the new, ultimate energy source. Antimatter research is a fascinating and rapidly evolving field. And who knows, maybe in the future, We'll be able to power our homes and cars with antimatter. Now that would be awesome. The most expensive stuff in the universe. Oh! Yeah, grandiose. It's called antimatter. Its existence was first theorized in 1930 when the electron was discovered. Scientists thought it might mean the exact opposite should exist too. And they call this hypothetical particle positron. Later, antipods of other elementary particles, protons and neutrons, were proven to exist as well. Morons came later. <laughs> when a particle and its evil twin collide with each other, they disappear, releasing literally tons of energy, 10,000 times more than a nuclear reaction does. But there's a catch. It takes about 100 billion years to create just one gram of antimatter. And it can only be created using the Large Hadron Collider. That's why the cost of this substance is about 62 trillion bucks. And we're not even close to getting that much. Throughout the entire history of space observation, only two objects from another star system, or maybe even another galaxy, have entered our solar system. The first one was the Oumuamua asteroid, discovered in 2017. The second was Borisov a comet found in August 2019. The cloud of dust that surrounds it allows scientists to learn more about substances that may have come to us from another galaxy. An unusual teardrop-shaped star was found. It has almost twice the mass of the Sun and looks like a big drop of lava because of the dwarf star hanging out nearby. The little buddy attracts the energy of its big brother and distorts its surface. Black holes can do that too. 
there's a star about 215 million light-years away from us that got spaghettified because of the gravity of a black hole nearby. Astronomers on Earth had to use dozens of telescopes to register the event. In the end, they saw a black hole gobbling up a star, which stretched until it became a thin ray of matter. As it was eating, the hole also ejected billions of tons of star material into space. About 250 million light-years away, though, there's a miraculous survival story. In 2020, a red giant came too close to a massive black hole, 400,000 times heavier than the Sun, and got caught in its gravitational pull. Normally, this means there's no escape. Once a black hole catches something, it will never let go of its prey. In this case, the star somehow managed to get away. Most of its outer layers were slurped away by the hungry black beast, leaving behind only the molten core, a white dwarf. And using this loss of mass, it ripped itself from the black hole's tug and started circling it at an ever-increasing orbit. Scientists are sure the white dwarf is still imprisoned forever, though, because the hole continues to chip away at it even as it gets further. In the end, the star will cool down and become a planet that looks much like Jupiter. But that might only happen in about a trillion years. I won't be around then. And much longer than the universe has been around so far. It was proved that a planet can orbit a black hole as it would a star. The energy from the hole would feed such a planet. But to survive in such conditions and not be pumped inside the event horizon, the planet must orbit very quickly at nearly the speed of light, and the black hole itself must spin at the same speed. I can't but imagine what kind of life it would be on such a planet. Um, fast? Earthquakes on the moon, or shall I say earthquakes, aren't something from science fiction. They don't occur as often as on our planet. And when they do, it happens closer to the center of the satellite. Scientists think moon quakes might be caused by the gravity of Earth and the Sun. There are Mars quakes, too. For a long time, the red planet had been considered tectonically inactive. But more recent observations have shown it still has weak quakes from time to time. You probably wouldn't even be able to feel them if you stood on Mars' surface. But it means some geological processes are still going on underneath the red and dusty landscape. At a distance of 640 light-years from the Sun, scientists discovered the planet WASP-76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its Sun and always turn to it with the same side. The term is tidally locked. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough that metals condense again and fall down as rain. Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the Sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. <laughs> Figures. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on other planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that it could fill all of our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans a thousand times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, 
It could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there just might be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of a comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of a star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only inhabitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. Until recently, we thought our galaxy looked like a circular spiral. But recent research has shown it looks more like a Pringles chip. Scientists measured the distances between the Sun and other stars and created a three-dimensional map of the Milky Way based on this data. It turned out that our galaxy is slightly curved at the edges and takes an S-shape. At this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in their turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. The biggest explosion since the Big Bang was registered in 2019. This happened in the Aphiochus Cluster, which unites thousands of galaxies. According to scientists, the blast was equal to 20 billion billion that's 18 zeros, megaton explosions happening once a millisecond for 240 million years. Eh, I'll have to trust that. My math is not that good. Remember the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth? Who could forget? There might have been another space show that ended badly for at least 75% of all life on our planet in the past. Roughly 360 million years ago, a supernova explosion occurred about 65 light years away from us, and the cosmic rays sent by it swept away the ozone layer of our pretty blue ball. If it had been any closer, all life could have easily been gone. Right now, the greatest threat for us comes in the form of Betelgeuse. Not the movie, but a giant star about 600 light years away. If it explodes into a supernova, we'll see it with unaided eyes even during the day. Have you heard about a diamond star that could put all the riches on Earth to shame? Or how about twinkling stars with surfaces made of solid iron? So let's take a look at these weird stars and try to unravel their mysteries. There's a star in the Centaurus constellation that was nicknamed Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes, it was named after a Beatles song, because it basically is a Beatles song. You see, the star was discovered to have a massive diamond at its core. Now, you may be wondering how big this diamond really is. Well. It's estimated to be about 10 billion trillion trillion carats. That's a 1 followed by 34 zeros. To put that into perspective, the Hope Diamond, which is one of the largest diamonds on Earth, is a measly 45.5 carats in comparison. Can you imagine the size of the ring you could make with this star diamond? And it's about the same mass as our sun. But don't get too excited about the prospect of owning this diamond just yet. Even if you were Jeff Bezos, you wouldn't be able to afford it. According to Ronald Winston, CEO of Harry Winston Inc., the diamond is so big that it would likely depress the value of the market. So you'd have to settle for a much smaller diamond engagement ring. One interesting thing about the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds star is that it's incredibly dense. In fact, 
It has the mass of the Sun crammed into an object only a third the diameter of Earth. That's like trying to fit an elephant into a shoebox. And yet, despite its massive size, it's actually quite cool, with a core temperature of only about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the core temperature of our Sun is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Since the discovery of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, several other crystallized stars have been found, some with diamond hearts the size of Earth. It just goes to show that the universe is full of surprises, and you never know what kind of treasures you might find out there in the vast expanse of space. And this isn't the only weird star we've discovered so far. There are many strange, unexplained things in outer space. For example, let's take Vega. Vega, also known as Alpha Lyrae, is a bright star located in the constellation Lyra. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky and is easily visible to the naked eye from most parts of the world. Now, Vega may look like a beautiful, bright star to us Northern Hemisphere folks, but little do we know, it's hiding a secret. It's actually quite squashed. You see, Vega's high spin rate causes it to bulge at the equator, kind of like a cosmic belly. It rotates once every 12.5 hours, which is pretty fast for a star, and it throws material out around its waistline. It's almost like the star is hula hooping. This material is further from the center of the star, so it experiences less gravity, causing it to cool and darken, leading to a gravity darkening effect. So Vega is basically a cosmic fitness guru's worst nightmare. Although for us stargazers, it still looks round because we're looking at it from Earth's pole end. However, if we saw it from a different angle, we'd get a very different view. One that might make us wonder if Vega has been sneaking some cosmic donuts behind our backs. But while we might joke about its equatorial waistline, there's no denying that Vega is still one of the brightest and most fascinating stars in our galaxy. But if you want something actually bright, then how about a supernova? Supernovas are giant space booms that occur when stars reach the end of their life cycle. It's like the grand finale of a fireworks show, but on a cosmic scale. They release more energy in a few seconds and our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. And this is exactly what happened to the next star of our show. This celestial object with a weird name, IPFT14HLS. But there's a catch. It isn't your average supernova. Even though this star made a blast in 2014 and started to fade away like usual, recently it made an unexpected comeback and brightened once more. <laughs> Talk about a dramatic entrance. And if that wasn't enough, this thing continued to fade and brighten at least five times in total, which is a bit like a yo-yo. It's like the star just couldn't make up its mind about whether it wanted to stay bright or fade away into the abyss. Also, when scientists measured the supernova's spectrum, they found that it was evolving 10 times slower than other stars. Maybe it's a supernova that just wants to enjoy its golden years. All in all, this object is a real mystery. But this is not the only star suffering from the 2-in-1 syndrome. At first glance, M.Y. Camelopardalis appears to be a fairly common star. But after a closer look, Astronomers concluded it was actually two stars in one. These two stars are orbiting each other at over 600,000 miles per hour. It's a contact binary star system, which means that the stars are so close together that they share a common envelope. In other words, they're so close to each other that they're practically smooching. These celestial Romeo and Juliet are one of the most massive known binary stars out there. Each of them individually weighs in at a whopping 32 and 38 solar masses, respectively. 
Astronomers also think that they might be on the brink of a stellar merger, which means that one day, they might just combine into one giant superstar. Wow, who knew space could be so romantic? Next, introducing another long name, HD 140283, also known as Methuselah's star. This little guy in the constellation Libra has been around for a while, and by a while, I mean a really long time. Actually, scientists used to think it was older than the universe itself. Just imagine if it turned out to be true. But eventually, they figured out that it's actually around 14.8 billion years old, a peer of our universe. That's still pretty impressive though. This star is so old, it remembers when the Milky Way was just a baby galaxy. But despite all that, this star still has some life left in it. It's just starting to expand into a red giant, which is kind of like when you hit your 30s. Talk about aging well. But if all these things are somewhat comprehensible, then how about a star that was literally named WTF star by scientists? No, I'm not kidding. At least it used to be. Now it's called Tabby's star. It also has a more scientific name, but that one is a bit of a mouthful. But what's really bizarre about this star is its irregular dimming. For some reason, it doesn't glow like a normal star, but blinks, as if someone turned on and off a flashlight. And it's not just a little dip, we're talking up to a 22% drop in light. So it's not because it sometimes gets blocked by a planet or something. Scientists have come up with all sorts of explanations for this strange behavior, from comets to dust to even an extraterrestrial megastructure. That's right, but before your imagination runs too wild, it's important to note that the most likely explanation is just plain old dust. Perhaps the star is surrounded by some kind of dust cloud, and sometimes it prevents us from seeing it clearly. Although this explanation is still not 100% confirmed, there are still plenty of mysteries surrounding Tabby's star. One thing's for sure, it may be a bit of an oddball, but that's what makes it so fascinating. So, there you have it, folks. We're left in awe of the incredible diversity and strangeness of the cosmos. There's so much more to discover out there. So, let's keep exploring and keep being amazed by the wonders of the universe. People are shouting and waving their hands in the auction room. The presenter can't calm everyone down because the lot on the table is the most expensive dirt in the world. Its price is about $9 billion, but it's really hard to imagine its real value. Because it's dirt from Mars, it's so expensive because it's going to take one decade, billions of dollars, and three space missions to deliver the dirt here to Earth. And we've already started the first mission, on July 30th, 2020, a single-use Atlas V rocket was launched from Earth's surface towards Mars. The cost of launching such a rocket is about $109 million. The rocket carried the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity drone. The flight took about seven months. On February 18th, 2021, the rocket finally reached its destination. The landing module carrying the rover and drone was launched into the atmosphere of Mars. The robotic heroes traveled inside a capsule faster than the speed of sound. Underneath, the capsule was protected by a heat shield to keep its valuable cargo from burning due to high temperatures. It was time for the team at NASA's Mission Control Center to clench their fists in hope that the landing would go smoothly. The entire process was automatic. Once the cargo capsule entered the atmosphere of Mars, a parachute successfully opened. This reduced the speed of the capsule to 1,400 feet per second. As soon as its drop speed went down to subsonic, the heat shield was dropped. At this point, people saw the surface of Mars for the first time with the help of the camera and radar placed inside the capsule. The capsule was already moving at speeds comparable to that of a supercar on a racetrack. The drop speed went down to 475 feet per second at an altitude of 6 miles above the surface. That's how high planes on Earth fly. At an altitude of about 2 miles, the 8 jet engines of the landing module started. 
the navigation system adjusted the landing trajectory. The landing module then separated from the parachute capsule and began its independent descent at a speed of 245 feet per second. Everyone at NASA's Mission Control Center was waiting for a successful landing. 1,000 feet above the surface, the rate of the descent is 100 feet per second. At about 65 feet above the surface, the sky crane system began lowering the rover to the surface. The Perseverance released its six wheels like an airplane releases its landing gear. The wheels of the rover were getting closer and closer to the surface. A few more feet and touchdown. At the same moment, the Perseverance cut the cables of the sky crane. The entire team on Earth erupted with joy. In the next second, the rover also cut the cables connecting it to the landing module. It flew off and made its own uncontrolled landing. In other words, it crashed into the surface of the red planet. The second step of the mission that's supposed to deliver the most expensive dirt in history to Earth began with collecting samples. This phase actually started long ago on Earth. The rover carries 43 titanium tubes. Each of them can hold a soil sample the size of a human pinky. While preparing these tubes in a laboratory on Earth, scientists first blew some air through the tubes. Then they bathed them in tubs with acetone and other chemicals to make sure no bacteria remained inside. Then they were placed in an oven heated up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit for 29 hours. When Perseverance collects samples in these tubes, they can be stored there for at least 10 years. By comparison, lunar soil samples put in sealed boxes could only be stored for 10 days. Perseverance also has a lot of equipment and spectrometers to research samples. It even has a powerful laser. The rover can melt solid rocks into plasma and then analyze their composition. Scientists hope to find traces of living organisms in these soil samples. That's exactly why Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater. This crater is as wide as the Great Salt Lake and was once filled with water. You can see dry riverbeds and clay deposits there. This makes scientists believe that once there was water in that region. And since water is the basis of all life, researchers hope to find traces of its existence here. Another goal of Perseverance is to test the technology that will make it possible to produce oxygen on Mars. People would need it for breathing and as rocket fuel. To do this, the rover uses MOXIE, which stands for the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. This is a box the size of a hamster cage that weighs as much as a large dog. Its purpose is to pressurize Martian air so that it resembles that on Earth and then heat it up. A chemical reaction with a special metal inside the box is supposed to break one atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. As a result, we'll have carbon monoxide in pure oxygen. If this technology proves successful, it'll be scaled 200 times. This way, we'll produce enough oxygen for astronauts to breathe and for rockets to be launched back to Earth. So the $2.7 million rover, this price includes its design cost, construction, and maintenance, will be collecting dirt and rock samples until 2023. It'll leave closed tubes with samples right on the surface of Mars, and almost a decade later, they'll be collected. People will need another rover to do that. A new mission will take several billion dollars to build. Then it'll need seven months to reach Mars. After that, there will be another complicated landing. It'll be a simple rover with big wheels. Those wheels will help it get around Martian hills. Large solar panels will power it with electricity. This rover will gather all the samples collected by Perseverance. Then, it'll load them into a case the size of a basketball and carry it toward the rocket that will land on Mars together with it. The next step will be to deliver the findings to Earth. The rocket with the soil and rock samples will have to take off from Mars and get into its orbit. Another spacecraft will be waiting for it there. The rocket will launch the sample case, and the spacecraft will catch it. This spacecraft will then start its engines and head back to Earth. Upon arrival, the spacecraft will drop an entry vehicle. It's basically a capsule protected by heat shields with the sample case inside. When the capsule enters Earth's atmosphere, it'll get very hot because of friction with the air. But the shields will protect the samples, and the capsule will land somewhere in Utah. The whole mission to deliver the samples will last about five years. Only after that, the samples will be ready for research. 
and people will finally find out if there's been life on Mars. Was it before the birth of Earth, around 4 billion years ago? Or was it before humans became an intelligent species? Scientists hope to find the answers to these questions. That's why these samples are actually worth a lot more than $9 billion. What if Mars indeed turned out to be a potentially habitable place and people could build a colony there? Then it'd be a few more decades of work before we could get to the red planet. To do this, people would have to use many dozens of rockets. First, an empty spacecraft would be sent into orbit with the help of a launch rocket. Then another rocket would deliver cargo to this spacecraft, and people would need one more rocket to refuel the spacecraft. Only then, a seven-month trip to Mars would begin. The spacecraft would have to deliver enough research equipment, building materials, and other supplies to Mars. Then we'd need to organize energy production. We could use nuclear power plants or solar panels for this. Houses for people would most likely be located underground. Mars's atmosphere doesn't have much protection from solar radiation, so people would have to hide from the sun. The next tasks would be fuel and oxygen production. Moxie could help us with this. And of course, food farming. People would grow food in airtight greenhouses right on Martian soil. But we'd still have to wear spacesuits there. To feel at home, people would have to terraform Mars. We'd have to heat the planet and create an atmosphere similar to that on Earth. The pressure on Mars right now only allows water to be in a frozen state. We'd have to make it liquid. Scientists offer many ways to do this. One of them is making a huge meteorite crash into Mars. But whatever method it is, it'd still take many dozens or even hundreds of years before we could call Mars our new home. It all happened in 1708. On June 8th, the Spanish galleon San Jose was going back home to Spain from the Caribbean. In total, there were 17 ships. The captain of the San Jose knew they were in for some trouble, as English ships were lurking in that area. He knew they would be after the treasure loaded on the ships. The price of the treasure from the New World was so astronomical that it could turn the course of historic events in Europe upside down. In order to be safe, the Spanish galleon was to reach Cartagena de Indias. It's where we have Colombia now. But sadly, other things were predestined for the San Jose. The four English ships appeared. The galleon couldn't just escape them. There was no choice but to turn around and fight. Then all the chaos started. Red flags showing that the battle started. Firing cannons, the smell of gunpowder. Nobody knows exactly how it all ended. As dusk fell, it was hard to see clearly what was happening. The only thing that remained in history was the sinking flagship San Jose. Then, silence. No wonder that San Jose, being the flagship, was the most strategically important galleon. She would carry an insane amount of precious metals, such as gold and silver, pearls, and gems such as emeralds. All of that went to stay on the bottom of the ocean for the next three centuries. But how come this lost treasure got so legendary? First off, the financial estimates made by scientists shocked people. The ship reportedly carried 7 million to 12 million pesos. Let's translate that to today's money. Yeah, it may not be the wealth that Elon Musk has, but it's around $10 billion. With that money, you could treat yourself to a couple of private jets, a whole car park of Lamborghinis, and a posh mansion. And you'd still have a lot of money left. You may think it all must have gotten rusty, just like the bits and pieces found in the Titanic. But when it comes to gold, things work differently. The Titanic didn't carry gold, or at least not that much of it. The jewels that were on the Titanic were personal belongings. And the cool thing about gold is that it never reacts with oxygen. It means that real gold won't rust or tarnish. So if your golden necklace got somewhat darker, it's a telltale sign it's not pure gold. It's an alloy, which is also cool, by the way, as you can easily clean it. Going back to San Jose's lost treasure, the golden coins there, even over 300 years later, were supposed to look the same way as the day they were minted. Now, going back to the place where the ship supposedly sank, 
Remember I told you the captain wanted to go to the shore where Columbia is today? Well, on December 4th, 2015, the ship was indeed found in the waters of Columbia. As with many other important things today, the world learned about it from a tweet. It was sent by the Colombian then-president Juan Manuel Santos. People have been looking for the San Jose for decades, and once it was finally found, it only got more popular, and even more myths about it began to appear. One of the legends was told by Senor Santos himself. After the wreck had been found, there was a short radio interview. Thing is, the discovery was pretty unexpected. Many people spent a lot of time and effort looking for that wreck, and many of them even gave up hope of ever finding it. Juan Manuel Santos told a story about how the wreck had been discovered. There was an official event outside Colombia where he was accosted by a man. He looked like the famous writer Hemingway. He sported a white beard and had white hair. The only thing that Hemingway-looking man wanted was two minutes of Santos's time. The president conceded and listened to the man. What happened next was unbelievable. The man pulled out an antique map, more precisely, a carefully framed copy, and told the president that no one else knew about it. The man pointed to one exact spot. He said that it was the exact location of the treasure, and that that place didn't appear on any other map. He guaranteed that he knew where the treasure was. The story sounded crazy and swashbuckling. Whoever that man was, he turned out to be right. His identity remains a mystery for everyone, but somehow, that man found the funding, determined the area to be inspected, and even made his way to meet the president. Right, the San Jose was stuffed with gold, and whoever found it would get filthy rich for the rest of their life. But let's face it, there's no way an ordinary person could ever discover such a treasure, as it requires too much effort and too much funding. But what if you're into treasure hunting, and you want to go and find some treasure chests somewhere? Well, I guess I have a story about ordinary people looking and even eventually finding real treasure. Meet Forrest Fenn, an eccentric millionaire who hid a $1 to $5 million treasure. The exact worth was unidentified. You see, even Mr. Fenn himself said he never tried to appraise it. Inside the chest, there were 265 American gold eagles and double eagles, ancient coins, gold nuggets, you name it. Forrest stashed the chest in the Rocky Mountains and announced the treasure hunt back in 2010. Now let's focus on a map for a little bit and see how vast the Rocky Mountains are. Basically, the treasure hunters were supposed to sweep the two countries, both the USA and Canada. At first, it was a small treasure hunt with only a couple of people who knew about it. But sometime later, there was pretty much a competition as tens of thousands of people set off to look for the treasure. There was research stating that over the decade, about 350,000 people tried their luck looking for the mystery chest. To announce the hunt, Forrest Fenn used a poem made up of 24 lines. The poem had some hints in it that most treasure hunters failed to decode. It was so well hidden that it took 10 years to finally discover it. There was also a blog called Thrill of the Chase, and on June 6, 2020, Mr. Fenn finally posted the long-awaited news. The treasure had been found. Forrest himself admitted that anyone who read the instructions from the poem carefully could find the treasure. The poem created a lot of buzz on the internet with many users trying to decode the nine hints the poem had. Some of them even suggested the possible keys to decode the puzzle. Those speculations might have helped the person who eventually found the treasure. At first, even Forrest Fenn himself didn't know who cracked all the codes in the poem, made it through the dense forest, and retrieved the chest. The lucky finder preferred to stay anonymous, and all we initially knew was that it was a man from the eastern United States. The winner sent a photograph to Forrest Fenn, and thus the treasure hunt was officially over. Sometime later, though, he revealed himself. It was Jack Stewart, a former journalist and medical student. The treasure was hidden under a canopy of stars in a forest in the Rocky Mountains. 
The vegetation there is lush, so the chest was hidden deep within. The chest had never been moved from the place where it was originally hidden. The exact location is still unknown, but we know that the treasure was hidden in Wyoming. Jack admitted that not all the advertised treasures were found in the chest. A small gold frog on a necklace and a Spanish emerald ring were missing. Forrest indeed found the frog in his collection and gave it to Stuif, but he failed to find the ring. The treasure hunt created by Forrest Fenn may seem extravagant, but he explained why he decided to start it. The only thing he claimed to have in mind was to give people some hope. It's kind of weird, but mining finds are often some of the most exciting discoveries. Ready for a treasure hunt? Or maybe we can just take a look at what other people found, without leaving our comfort zone, you know. Tanzanite is a stone that's more valuable and expensive than diamonds. This gem was first discovered in 1967 in, the name probably gives it away, Tanzania. Tanzanite became popular after Tiffany & Company began to use it in their jewelry. The stone cost $200 to $350 per carat. This number isn't that high compared to other gems on my list, but experts say that the stone's price will rocket up in the next 20 to 25 years. Its deep blue violet hue differs the gem from others. Plus, it can only be mined in one place on Earth. The next gemstone is red beryl. Although they're not as rare as some others, like black opal, it's hard to find gem-quality ones. And you can only come across red beryl on a mountain in Utah. Yet, with its few different shades of a darker red, this gemstone is one of the rarest in the whole beryl family. Prices for this red beauty can reach up to $10,000 per carat. But good luck finding it on sale! With their mesmerizing green hues, emeralds are quite popular. Most emeralds have minor imperfections, like me. On rare occasions, a natural emerald without any flaws appears on the market. It can be sold for jaw-dropping money. Oh, that would hurt. For instance, when the historic Rockefeller Emerald was auctioned off, the 18-karat gemstone was purchased for $5.5 million, which is $305,000 per carat. This way, it broke all records, being the highest price per carat emerald ever sold. Now, opal is a valuable multicolored stone, found mostly in Australia. The most common types are white, gray, and green opals. But here, I want to focus on the rarest one, black opal. Black opal has many colors in it, like a rainbow. And each time you look at it, you may see some other colors that you haven't noticed before. It's really hard to mine this one. There's no guarantee at all that you'll find it. This virgin rainbow opal is valued at $1 million and has become the world's most expensive opal. It was discovered in 2003 by John Dunstan. What's even cooler is that it was found inside an ancient cuttlefish skeleton. Hmm, who would think of looking there? This is a ring with the sunrise ruby. Its name comes from a poem with the same title written in the 13th century. What makes this stone famous, it's not its name, though. It was sold in 2015 for 30 million bucks, which made it the most expensive ruby ever. The buyer's identity was kept secret. Comment below if it's you. It isn't just gemstones that cost a fortune. Here is one of the most expensive metals in the world, rhodium. It's not as well known and popular as, let's say, platinum. But it is gradually becoming one of the hottest things on the market. 80% of the demand for rhodium comes from the global automotive industry. So it's wanted, but it's super rare. Annual rhodium production is around 30 tons. For comparison, gold miners dig up between 2,500 and 3,000 tons of this precious metal every year. Now you can see why rhodium is so pricey. The term gold nugget makes me smile and feel hungry at the same time, because it's too close to chicken nuggets. Really? Yeah. Anyway, the world's largest gold nugget is now older than a century. Two miners found this huge chunk of precious metal in the gold fields of Australia in 1869. It weighed 214 pounds and was 24 inches long. The miners named it Welcome, Stranger! These two people instantly became rich. In those days, you could turn into a millionaire overnight. Nowadays, we have Lotto. Very unlikely, but possible. One of the grandchildren of the miners said that when people heard her name, 
they always asked her where the gold was or if she was rich. She answered that she wasn't. In fact, she didn't have any jewelry made from the welcome stranger. Well, that's a shame. Imagine you're 12 and find a diamond worth $15,000 while you're walking in a park. This actually happened to Michael Detlaff. He probably used all his luck in life that day. Of course, in a normal park, you can see trees, leaves, rocks, and so on. But in the Crater of Diamonds State Park, you can find a real diamond. This park is very special because it's where eight of the largest diamond deposits in the world are located. And anyone, literally anyone, can just go there and search for diamonds. And it gets even better. The policy is finders keepers. So yeah, just go find yourself a diamond there. You might even turn out luckier than Michael Detlaff. And he found the 5.16 carat diamond after less than a minute search. Have you ever seen the largest orange diamond ever sold at auction? Well, it was bought for $35.5 million in 2013. This is about $2.4 million per carat, which is the highest price per carat paid for a colored diamond at auction. Now, miners have recently discovered the largest pink diamond found in more than 300 years. The diamond has the nickname Lulo Rose, which comes from the Lulo Mine in northeastern Angola. The pink diamond weighs 170 carats. Right now, the largest pink diamond in the world is the 182 carat Darya Ainur from the Iranian collection of national jewels. But the newly discovered Lulo Rose is almost as large. Pink diamonds are relatively rare, too. Science can't fully explain what gives the gem that rosy hue. Hey, maybe they're shy or embarrass easily. But the fact is that they're worth a lot of money. In 1999, miners in South Africa uncovered a rough 132 carat pink diamond, later called the Pink Star. In 2013, the Pink Star was sold for approximately $83 million at auction. This way, it became the most expensive gemstone ever sold. In 2000, miners found a gigantic jade stone in Canada, 18 tons. They wanted to keep the stone, but then they got a generous offer. The buyers wanted to turn the huge piece of jade into a Buddha statue. Eventually, the stone was carved into a statue weighing 4 tons. Now, you might be sitting on a fortune hidden under your house or in the backyard. Every now and then, people discover strange and valuable things on their property. This is what happened to a lucky gem trader in Sri Lanka. He had problems with the water supply, so he decided to have a well drilled in his backyard. Workers found a 2.5 million carat sapphire cluster there. It weighed more than 1,000 pounds and was worth around $100 million on the market. Well, that should fix his water supply. We talk about rare black opals, and I can't help but mention opal pineapple. It's one of the rarest and most fascinating types of opal. It's not a fossilized fruit or something like that, only the shape of this cluster of crystals resembles that of a pineapple. These opal pineapples are only found on the white cliffs in Australia. Now, if there's a gold nugget, there should be silver nuggets too, right? And they do exist. In fact, the largest silver nugget ever mined was found in the United States. It weighed 1,853 pounds. It was too large to be carried in one piece, so it was cut into three pieces and moved from the Smuggler Mine near Aspen, Colorado in 1894. Now look at this sparkling purple gemstone. The Empress of Uruguay is the perfect amethyst geode in the world. That's a hollow rock with thousands of perfect crystals that formed inside. This geode is 130 million years old. It's 11 feet high and weighs 2.5 tons. So imagine extracting something that big from the soil. It took miners three months to take it out from the solid basalt which surrounded it. So what would you do if you found something as precious as these treasures? What do you think lies at the bottom of the ocean? What if I told you that together with the remains of the Titanic and other mysterious underwater animals, ocean floors have buried over 20 million tons of gold within them? Crazy, right? As it seems, that gold is of difficult extraction, and nobody has attempted to dig it out. But if it were to be extracted, each human alive on the planet could be gifted 9 pounds of gold. Now, would you imagine that? In 2016, during an auction at a large fish market in Tokyo, Japan, 
An endangered species of bluefin tuna was sold for 14 million yen, which is the equivalent of more or less 117,000 US dollars. And that wasn't even the most expensive fish ever sold. As it appears, bidding on fish has become sort of a tradition at the Skigi. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Anyways, at this famous fish market in Japan. The first auction of the new year attracts bidders from all over the world to place their bets in the hopes of buying rare species of fish. Apparently, the bluefin tuna ranks as one of the most expensive fish out there today. It weighs around 989 pounds. Back in 2019, a single one was sold for a mind-boggling price of $3.1 million, the highest amount anyone has paid for a fish so far. If we do the math, that means one pound of bluefin tuna costs around 3,600 bucks. Who knew fish could be that expensive? A recent study conducted in 2011 showed that a single reef shark in Palau, an island nation in the Pacific Ocean, would have an estimated life value of nearly $2 million. This value is based on the number of tourists that reef sharks attract to dive sites. That's pretty neat. There is no doubt that the ocean is full of riches. It may seem crazy to think about nature this way, but if someone wanted to buy all the ocean water and everything inside it, do you have any idea how much it would cost? Is that price even measurable? Well, according to research published by the World Wildlife Fund in association with the Global Change Institute from the University of Queensland, the net worth of the ocean is indeed quantifiable, and there are reasons why that is so. But before we reveal the price tag, let's try to understand the scope of what we're talking about. Now, oceans occupy over 70% of the Earth's surface. They carry around more or less 320 cubic miles of salt water. For scale, it would take around 800 trillion Olympic-sized pools to fill all the water in the ocean. 800 trillion. Now, that's a lot of swimming pools, I'll give you that. The ocean occupies over 99% of the Earth's total living space. That's almost our entire planet. If that doesn't sound right, do you have any idea how deep oceans are? We could probably fit all the cities of the world down there, and there would still be ample space left. Some say that if you took Mount Everest, turned it upside down, and tossed it on one of the ocean's deepest ends, it still wouldn't reach the seabed. There would be a little over a mile left to reach the ocean floor. The truth is, we know very little about our oceans. Much more money and effort has been dedicated to space travel. For instance, isn't it funny to think that even though we are 239,000 miles away from the Moon, and even further away from Venus and Mars, the surface of these planets has been almost 100% photographed and studied by modern scientists. How much of our seabed would you guess we've mapped so far? Well, what if I told you? that we've charted only 5% of all seafloors. Crazy, right? It gets even crazier if we think that over 94% of all living beings are actually aquatic creatures. And so many of these we have no idea about. Some say that the ocean is the final frontier of humankind. And it is true that very few people have ventured down into the deep waters. We've sent over 12 men to walk the moon, But no more than four men have attempted to dive all the way down to the deep, deep sea. For example, does the name James Cameron ring a bell? Who here still hasn't watched Titanic? Well, Cameron was the director of the blockbuster movie Titanic, and some years after he shot it, he took part in one of the two manned expeditions ever to go down to Challenger Deep. Now, Challenger Deep, as the name suggests, is one of the furthest points at the bottom of the ocean. It's located deep within the Mariana Trench. Cameron decided he wanted to be the first man to arrive at the deepest point of the ocean, and so he did. Now, prior to him, Challenger Deep had only been reached by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh back in the 1960s. But Cameron managed to travel even farther down than the previous expedition. He was the first one to have touched the astounding depth of 35,787 feet below the surface. Even more shocking is to know that the submersible he rode on to arrive at such depth cost him around $10 million. The expedition itself cost half that, adding up to a total of $15 million to satisfy his wish. But none of this compares to the final price for shooting the movie Titanic 
which arrived at an estimate of $200 million back in 1998. Did you know that the ocean actually grows in size? I mean, it's already huge, and it has no plans of getting smaller. According to research, the Atlantic Ocean grows 2 inches bigger every year. Now, how could we ever put a price tag on something so unique and essential to life as the ocean? According to the World Wildlife Fund, measuring the price of the ocean is a way of bringing awareness and attention to one of the world's most precious jewels. This type of measuring happens through what is called ecosystem valuation. There are normally two ways of deciding how much something costs. One is through market valuation, and the other is non-market valuation. Imagine that. Which means that someone goes around asking other people how much they would hypothetically pay for something. In this case, the ocean. And then later, economists do some type of crazy calculation and arrive at an estimated price. They try to factor in all of what we've mentioned before. The astronomical price of bluefin tuna, for example. The life value of a shark. Maybe they even ask James Cameron how much he would pay for all of the ocean. Well, jokes aside, the non-market price they arrived at for the ocean was $24 trillion. According to this estimated price, the ocean is worth more or less the same amount as the GDP of a few powerhouse countries of the world. If compared to the world's top 10 economies, the ocean would rank number one with an annual value of $24 trillion. If we were to dig a little deeper, this would mean that one cubic mile of water from the ocean costs $13. Well, that's a little more affordable, isn't it? Even if it is highly valued economically, oceans are essential not only to human life, but to the majority of the world's animal and fish population. Life on Earth would be impossible without ocean water, which is why it is so important to make it highly accessible. It's not like we need a spaceship to visit the nearest ocean. Depending on where you live on the globe, a few hours drive or a short stroll and you're there. If you were asked how much you would hypothetically pay for all of the world's seabed, how much would you consider paying for it? A few trillions as well? Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the Philosopher's Stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course. The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, this dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started, 
and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, Astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then, this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than 2 billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, people find gold deposits large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done! Your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. 
This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitri Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. The Fokang meteorite is almost the same age as our solar system, 4.5 billion years old. It's the most expensive meteorite on the planet. The thing's composed of metals and olivine, a crystal called the cosmic precious stone. The meteorite was split into pieces, which were then sold one by one. The total price is $1.8 million. In New Orleans, you can taste ice cream for the price of an apartment in New York. Strawberries are nose dessert features strawberries, spices, mint, and vanilla ice cream. All this splendor is accompanied by a white gold ring with a 7-carat pink diamond. A serving costs almost 4 million bucks. For $3 million, you can buy three cool sports cars or a collar for your dog. But if you choose the second option, you'll have to pay an additional $200,000. But 1,600 diamonds on the collar shine so beautifully, and your buddy is irresistible. Hey, everybody loves dinosaurs, especially the collector who's recently bought a T-Rex skeleton at auction. For 32 million bucks, he received a petrified set of 200 bones. By the way, this dino was nicknamed Stan. The Universal Waste Management System, that's what NASA calls their new space toilet for astronauts. The thing is complicated, and the engineer spent $23 million to make it work. And hey, remember to put the seat down when you're done. The Hong Pao tea is 30 times more expensive than gold. A pot of this drink will cost you $10,000. Pickers pluck tea leaves only from extremely rare ancient trees. They also just take a couple of leaves from the upper branches. A New Zealand collector bought a brown and white feather for $7,000. It belonged to the Huya bird, which no longer lives on the planet. Experts confirm the feather was real. It wasn't an ordinary turkey that dropped it. Let's say you have 90,000 bucks. Will you buy a car, an apartment, or go on a yacht trip around the world? <laughs> for this money, an insect enthusiast from Japan bought a huge stag beetle for his collection. Now, experts say this mineral water has a mild taste and fresh smell. The most expensive bottle is made of 24 karat solid gold and costs $60,000. There are cheaper bottles without the precious exterior. They sell for a mere $3,600. The water itself comes from three sources – springs in France and Fuji and glaciers in Iceland. Bottoms up! How to make anything cost a fortune? Add diamonds! This pair of jeans sells for 1.3 million bucks. It's all about the gemstones on the back pockets. $250,000. That's how much nail polish can cost. To make the lacquer truly luxurious, the creators added 267 carats of black diamonds to it. 
1927, Captain Charles Lindbergh flew his plane across the Atlantic. The pilot's portrait was then printed on 200 matchbooks. In 2019, a collector bought one of them for a record $6,000. He paid another $13 for shipping. Are you dreaming of an insanely expensive skateboard? Get yourself the Golden Skateboard, which costs $15,000. Yep, it's a fully functional thing made entirely of gold. As a gift, you'll receive cotton gloves that won't leave scratches on the precious surface. Never mind the gold you leave while doing your insane tricks. Hey, everything is better when covered in gold. It's probably the motto of those who created the world's costliest keyboard. Its price is $4,500. The keys are covered with the sap of a Japanese lacquer tree and sprinkled with gold dust. Oops, you've been careless. And now there's some gold dust on the floor. Good thing there's a $22,000 vacuum cleaner. It's not only powerful, but also adored with 3,700 Swarovski crystals. When you go to Italy, be sure to try the Louis XIII pizza. This dish is high in calories, but your wallet will lose $12,000 in weight. The dough takes 72 hours to rise, and the list of ingredients is amazing. Three types of caviar, lobster, the finest mozzarella. By the way, the restaurant has a delivery service. Now, after you've finished, you can put empty pizza boxes in a designer trash bag. Yep, it only costs $1,950 per piece. On the bright side, the bag is waterproof and has a shoulder strap. Now, where should you throw this bag? Of course, to the golden trash can, which costs from $10,000 to $15,000. But you'll have to try hard to find one. Only 25 pieces were made, and all of them were sold long ago. An Australian company once made one roll of $1.3 million toilet paper. It was three-ply, durable, and gold-bladed. And yes, it was offered in a gift box. Gee, at that price, I think I'd want it reusable. But we'll skip the details. The Platinum Arowana Aquarium Fish costs more than $400,000. Its platinum coloring is the result of a rare genetic mutation. In Asia, this fish is considered a symbol of wealth. You think? A set of these staples will cost you 80 bucks. They are gold-plated and sold in a velvet box. They can be used not only to bind paper, but also as a decoration for a tie or shirt. Fishing enthusiasts will appreciate the giant Haskell minnow lure. It was made from copper in 1853. That's the first lure with a movable tail. In 2003, the thing was bought by a collector for more than $100,000. This bike has no sporting achievements. Neither is it hunted by antique dealers. But it's plated with 24 karat gold and sold for a crazy $390,000. An Indian businessman bought a single-digit license plate registered in Dubai. It cost him $9 million. When he handed the check, he admitted he had a collection of unique license plates. The Passion Diamond Shoes took nine months to create. Adorned with 236 small diamonds, they have two huge 15-karat gemstones sitting at the center. No wonder the price is so impressive. The shoes cost $17 million. This 1969 Volkswagen toy car is a gem. Among collectors, its value is estimated at $150,000. And the price increases every year, because only two of such bright pink cars exist now. Would you like to have backgammon for $5 million? This board game's made of almost 15 pounds of gold and decorated with more than 60,000 black, white, and yellow diamonds. The Jewel Royale chess set is almost twice as expensive, $9.8 million. The pieces are made of gold and platinum and decorated with pearls, diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. This bed will cost you $6.3 million. It's made of wood and 235 pounds of solid gold. If needed, the headboard can be embedded with diamonds. Hey, why not? If the first option is suitable for a royal palace, this bed is probably made for a spaceship. Thanks to magnetic technology, it hovers above the floor and can support the weight of an adult bison. You can get this bed for your bedroom for $1.6 million. Uh, the bison comes separately. 
presenting the most expensive sushi sticks. This set includes two pairs of sticks, carved from rosewood and are hand-polished. They'll cost you $400. Now, if you don't know what to spend your money on, hey, I can use some help. Otherwise, maybe buy yourself gold shoelaces for $19,000. If it's too much, consider getting their silver alternative. It's only $3,000. Are you about to go to the beach? Why don't you take these slippers? They're bright and hand-painted with 18 karat gold. They also have an unusual square shape. The price? $18,000. Oh, and since you're heading for the seaside, here's one of the most expensive beach towels. It's very soft to the touch and costs 530 bucks. The nightingale of Kuala Lumpur isn't the name of a rare bird. This is a dress worth $30 million. Created in 2009, it's decked with 750 diamonds. The main decoration is a huge pear-shaped diamond at the center. What's real luxury? Maybe a $10,000 comb? It's made of rose gold and sold in an ostrich leather case. If you decide to buy this comb, your name will be written on it. Bob, Fran, Priscilla, (laughs) just imagine. $3.8 million. This is the price of the 1001 Nights Diamond Purse. To create it, jewelers used 4,500 diamonds and spent 8,800 hours. Thanks to the gold chain, you can carry the heart-shaped bag over your shoulder. The question remains what to put into it. Claudius Ptolemy was the scientist who created the first printed atlas on the planet. His friends called him Claude. The book is called The Geography. In 2006, a collector bought one of the three remaining copies of the atlas for $3.9 million. The book is around 500 years old. This Christmas wreath is handcrafted and woven from the finest and most exotic plants. But it's worth $4.6 million, not because of the ivy berries, eucalyptus leaves, and lingonberry stalks. The wreath is adorned with 40 diamonds and rubies. You better not hang it on your front door. Shenzhen Nongki Orchid is the Frankenstein of the flower world. For eight years, researchers were growing it in a laboratory. And then, the flower was sold at an auction for, brace yourself, $200,000. The plant blooms very rarely and is difficult to care for. Yeah, just what you need. Hey, I know somebody like that. Have you ever wondered what the most precious thing on the planet is? The answer to this question was given by NASA experts. Just one gram of antimatter would cost you $62.5 trillion. Antimatter is a mirror image of matter, indivisible particles of the material world. Scientists have been able to create a tiny amount of antimatter in the laboratory. Oof, 